Hey, Pronouncers, <laughs> welcome back to another episode of Printavo Pronouncers Podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printavo. We've got our co host, Stephen Farrig, and drumroll, please, very special guest out of New York, Upstate Merch, Dylan Gilligan. Thanks very much for joining us. What's up? The, we, uh... Uh, Dylan, uh, Dylan's out of uh, like three different podcasts, two TV episodes, and a book. Yeah, we had to uh, talk to his agent to get him mm-hmm. on. Yeah, um, it was a process. Um, link in the bio if, if you'd like to book Dylan for an appearance. Um, you know, well, I'm usually is, free. I'm usually free at nine in the morning because you yeah. psycho. Yeah, like you, to do you confirmed with me. Uh, I think twice. Like, wow, okay, are you sure? And I was like, well, it's New York time there, so Eastern yeah. it should be like nine a.m. I would guess, but. Yeah, you said you're in a little cold. Like, so is that a room you're you're renovating in your house or in a shop? No, it's at the shop. So oh, okay. for years and years, 10 years now since we've owned the building, uh, we've had like one uh, like office space where basically like me and the other sales guys are in the same room, kind of in like a U-shaped desk thing. Um, and I own the whole building. So we decided to renovate... Uh, the center section it was an antique store for years like i rented it out to this old couple and uh they ended up moving on uh and we renovated the whole middle section so i'm finally gonna have like my actual own office which is super nice and that's what i'm sitting in right now because if i wasn't sitting here and i was sitting at my actual desk you would hear like crazy amount of obscenities and things that are not good for podcast listeners (laughs) <laughs> so I decided to uh, tough it out and sit over here with no heat. So, so there's no heat on that side of the building yet? Yeah, they're <laughs> actually, they're literally putting the heaters in today. So by Monday, this whole side should be heated. Everything's good. But I'm also in New York, so it's like, you know, 25 degrees at night. So You uh, could put like a little good. buddy dryer by your, uh, <laughs> by your desk. Yeah, I could. Um, I think most shops sometimes are heated by... By dryers. their dryers, yeah. Um, so today's uh, today's uh, an interesting morning. It's the the you know for listeners, it's the Wednesday after the election. Um, we brought Dylan in as our, our political expert um, hmm. <laughs> to uh, to. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Our correspondent. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> Dylan's our fur- correspondent. The um, furthest from, from the- that. Yeah, but uh, Dylan, we you know I I don't. I don't know how we've met. Um, maybe internet friends. I would just call it internet <laughs> Probably, friends. Yeah. I think we have a lot of internet friends in this industry. Um, but you know, I've I've always asked shops this on the podcast. If we were to meet at a trade show, give us your uh, give us your thirty second rundown of Upstate Merch and what you do. Well, if you don't know who I am already, then you're missing out. Uh, no, I um, my name is Dylan Gilgan. I own Upstate Merch. Uh, obviously, we're in Upstate New York. Uh, we started in 2009. Uh, we started in a two-car garage, lasted a year there, uh, purchased the building we're in now, uh, have grown. From music or like were you in a band before? Yeah, I was in a band before. It's a classic screen printer story. Um, and I was the guy in the band who basically booked the show or not booked the sh- Yeah, tried to book the shows and help promote and did the merch and all that stuff. So um Why'd you say tried? What tried to book shows? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Because everybody just you know back then with like being in like a hardcore band, I feel like you just kind of take whatever shows are coming. So I didn't yeah. really have to book them. It was more just like every weekend there was a place to play. So, um, so yeah, that spiraled into um, printing our own merch out of my. Uh, grandfather's shop he had like a sign shop um so i went there and i printed shirts like knew nothing about screen printing basically just uh went down to ac moore walmart or whatever bought blanks came back printed them all white ink probably not cured all the way uh and then sold them at shows but it was so crazy like when we were in the band it was like we were that band that had like everything we had like sweatpants and tees and hoodies and all this stuff and then all the all the kids would come out and buy everything and then the next day would be like let's do the same thing but in blue ink and then the same kids would buy the same shirts because it was in blue not in white and it was just funny because like we made a lot of money with merch and we realized it was like a big thing 
but even then I never thought like, Oh, let's do like, I want to be a screen printer. Um, and then long story short, I, I started a company called uh, merch buttons. So I made like one inch buttons. That's how I started. And then I did that for a while. Do you have the press in your house or? Yeah. The little manual, uh, yeah. you know, ka-chunk, ka-chunk thing. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I started a website and that was when I started, that was when MySpace started. So that was like, like when you were doing the band, it was always like forums and, uh, message boards and stuff to talk to people and book shows and all that stuff. Yeah. And then MySpace came out and it was like huge because it was like, you could literally just like wild west message everybody and be like, Hey, I want to do this. Or do you want to work with us? Or do you need buttons or whatever? And then, uh, I did that for a long time. And then a buddy of mine, uh, Ben Landy, who used to, well, still a big designer, uh, design stuff for like hot topic and stuff at the time. And he was like, Hey, you should really think about selling t-shirts and stickers. And I was like, dude, I don't know anything about that. He's like, well, I have a buddy here in Georgia that, uh, that does it, which was terminus. Really? And John, yeah, John. <laughs> so, oh, cause he was super into music too. He played in a pretty big band, right? Yeah. So I knew I was introduced to John and then I started, uh, outsourcing my shirts to John. And it got to a point where I was like sending them a ton of work, mm-hmm. like regularly, like t-shirt order every day, you know, a couple t-shirt orders every day. It got to the point where John was like, Hey, what if I buy your button company and move you to Georgia and you like work with me in the office? Cause at the time it was just him in the office doing sales. Uh, and he was, and I was like, I had nothing else going on. So I was like, yeah, sh- let's do it. So, uh, he bought the company and then how did that my work? Wife got, how did that work with like absorbing, you know, you like, like, it was, was it a it bonus was, or something or it was really weird because I, I'm not like a super businessy guy. I just more was like circumstance of like, I want to do this and I can make money at this. Mm. Um, and I never super thought about it, but at the time I was just doing buttons to do buttons and like make some side cash. It wasn't like I was doing it full time. I was actually working at Sears at the time, like installing appliances. And then I would do buttons at night and then I would do play shows on nights and weekends. And then, uh, yeah. So anyway, John took the, took the company and then moved me down there. So I literally like got married. Um, and the next day got in a moving truck and moved to Atlanta. Your wife came down too. Yeah. So it was me and her like literally the next day, like honeymoon, whatever was just driving to Georgia in a Penske (laughs) truck. Um, so we got there and then, yeah, I was working, doing sales at Terminus for probably almost two years, like, yeah, almost two years. And then, uh, it was good. Like I learned a lot there from, like I said, it was, it was kind of the same setup I had here where it was like one office, me and John were in the same room and, you know, I already kind of knew how to do sales. So I, I just like hit the ground running with that and was like, all right, I'm just going to hit up whoever I can talk to whoever I can, uh, get sales in. And then we grew terminus really well to where they basically bought a new building, which I think is the new building they're in now. And then I just came to terms with like, I didn't love Georgia. I didn't like where we were. Cause where I'm from here is like super rural. Like we're in the trees and like everybody in town knows who you are. Um, down there it was like culture shock. It was like, just not for me. I mean, it was cool, but like, I didn't, couldn't see myself like living there forever. So I told John, I was like, Hey, uh, you know, I want to move back to New York. And I mean, I don't know if I want to go into that a ton, but he didn't love that idea. (laughs) So, uh, when I knew that I was going to leave there, I already had gained all this knowledge of like printing and like what the whole industry was about and everything while I was there. So when I came back to New York, it was a no brainer of like, yeah, I'm going to start my own company. Like I'm just going to start over and do my own print company. So, but again, he didn't like that very much. Um, Why? Cause he thought you were going to take customers or. Yeah. I think it was just cause like, he's a, he's a competitive guy and I get it. Um, Hi John, if you're listening to this, we love hey, you. Hey John, yeah. Your 399T uh, thing still still slays, and everyone gets pissed <laughs> off about it. But we know why you do it, and you're crushing it. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I was a big part of that when we were there. So um, you invented it that. <laughs> don't put that on me. All right. <laughs> no, he he's a very good marketer. I mean, he the, <laughs> like the video yeah. stuff and all. Can I ask yeah. you actually uh, really quick before you keep going on the sales side yeah. where you talk about how you really grew it a lot and it was just you two. You know, you were, it sounded like you just said you were just pounding pavement and just meeting people. What was that process like? More in detail, what were you doing? Um, well, basically, like I said, from the beginning, it was the hustle of same thing with like trying to get shows and stuff. It was just messaging people. It wasn't like I would never cold call people ever. I was just more like email or, you know, meeting people at shows or meeting people at events or whatever and just like talking to them like a normal person. And that's been my, that's been the way I've done this whole company the whole time is just kind of like shooting the shit with people and being real and just being like, Hey, uh, I print stuff. Here's some of the stuff I print. Uh, and they usually are like, Oh, cool. I like the way that looks. And then you start the conversation and then go from there. There was never really like sales tactics or anything mm -hmm. or like, what it was were, always just what like, the who emails, do I want to work though? with? You know, cause those are, coldish emails right unless you already knew them before yeah um it depended on who we were trying to to get but a lot of times back then it was a lot of bands because me and john both knew the band market um so it's it's like hey i was in this band or hey uh i really liked your new album or whatever and then you'd start a conversation and then you'd be like hey uh who do, who prints your merch and then you get into that conversation and then that turns into, uh, well, we'd like to print your merch. Uh, here's the pricing that we can offer and, you know, we can drop ship it to the venues and, you know, so on and so forth. So it really, it was just starting a conversation with people. And that, like I said, that's kind of like how I've always done it. Got it. Um, it was really out of that space that you knew. Because I see a lot of questions of people always asking, how, how do I get more sales? Like, how do I keep growing? how do I bring on a sales rep? What do I have them do? And it's interesting, like, you know, yeah. tossing out a compliment of the area that you know very well. And then asking I think that's, I think that's the biggest thing that a lot of people don't get is I feel like they just, they're looking at it as I'm a screen printer. So I should be printing for everybody. Um, like anybody who needs merch, like I'm going to try to print for them and they don't focus on like one thing or, you know, even 10 things they could be like, all right, like me personally, I could be like, I like motorcycles. I like bands. Uh, I like Sasquatch. I like, you know, stuff like that. Like you can literally like focus on that and be like, okay, I'm going to not go after, but like, I'm going to focus on that niche market, you know, like motorcycle stuff. Like there's a ton of groups, ton of clubs, ton of like motorcycle clothing lines, all that stuff. Like you already know the lingo to talk to those people. You know what I mean? You're yeah. in it. You can be like, hey, yeah, I have three Harleys and I like riding here and so on. You can have you're a conversation. You're legit right you, away. It, it becomes right. less not, of a sales yeah. conversation. Right. That's what I mean. It's not a sales pitch. It's a, hey, let's start a conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and, that's kind of the way we, we, we just do that all the time. We're like, all right, what are we into right now? Let's talk to those people. So like our thing with Upstate here, like m most of our clients are people that we can relate to. Not necessarily just like, oh, this is, you know, some random business that we do for. And we do a lot of that because they just come here. Like naturally, I mean, you guys know, like you just get business from other people. But like our core group, our like 80-20 is um, stuff that we're into. Gotcha. So is it is it safe to say like, because shops ask a ton. I just got a message this morning, like sales, 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 sales. And it's like, you've engulfed yourself in your hobbies and what you're passionate about. And because right. of that, you become the merch guy for those exactly. communities. Yeah. Are you still being the owner of the company? I know you've got sales guys or you've got like a team there. Does it still pretty resonate like from your vision of, of do people still look for like Dylan or is it now established to the point where they, they come to upstate? Yeah, I feel like I feel like it's a little of both. Um, I still definitely do some sales stuff, but everybody who's here kind of all has the same core values. So it's like our culture here, like everybody. And that's what's funny. A lot of people comment on like our structure because my main my core employees have been with me for the full 10 years. Wow. So 
were all and and the funny thing is all of us my core people are all people i was in the band with and i've known since i was like like 12 years old wow so i think there's like a there's a certain amount of loyalty where it's like you guys have been through so much together right yeah and that's something i struggle with right like i'm younger i've got employees that are older than me i haven't been in the trenches with them as much so you're trying to like build that up as quickly as possible but when you have that like just don't have problems. I mean, sure everyone has <laughs> yeah. problems, right? And I feel like I feel like this is a this is like a catch twenty two thing too. But like everybody that's here knows everything. Like I don't keep all the business secrets of like how we're doing and like what we're purchasing and all this other stuff a secret. Like we all talk about it because I'm not gonna say like I'm the business owner. I'm the smartest person here because I'm not at all. Like at all. Um, so if I have something we're going to do, I talk to everybody here and I'm like, what are your thoughts? Like, should we get this? Or, you know, my first thing with like CTS or anything like that, I go to Brian who does like the art and steps and stuff. Cause he's the one who has to do it all day long. I'm not going to make the decision and be like, figure this out. <clears throat> um, it's more like, what do you think? Or do you think we should go this route? And then, yeah, so it's nice having these guys because I lean on them and they lean on me. And the funny thing is, is there's days where I'm like, dude, it's really nice out. Let's just go on a motorcycle ride to like Syracuse and get barbecue. And then like half the guys here will be like, I don't know if we should, because like we have these jobs that are due on like Wednesday and this and this. And I'm like, I'm the owner. I'm saying, let's go on a motorcycle ride and like get barbecue. And they're like, no man, like sit down. Like we have shit to do. And it's funny. Cause it's like, that's how dedicated these guys are to be like, I want to make sure everything's out and good and everything that it needs to be. And I'm the kid who's like trying to poke at them and be like, let's do something else. Let's do something mm. else. Wow. Have you, have you ever had to, to let go of a friend? Yeah. How, how did, what happened? <laughs> um, well, basically there was, there was a guy that I knew again from high school. Like I used to drive him to school and, uh, he didn't work here for, for the first, like, I don't know, three, four years or something. But he hit me up one day and was like, Hey, you know, I'm looking for a job. And I was like, all right, cool. Hired him because I trusted him and knew him. And, uh, again, it was just one of those things where, uh, his personality didn't mesh with, like it meshed with me and my core, like guys, like friends, because we were all friends. But the problem was, is like any time, and everybody's had this conversation about like the toxic guy in the shop mm-hmm. that brings everybody down. He was that guy. Right. Okay. So like any time we hired anybody new, he was like ultra critical of what they were doing, and like he was like he was on one press and another guy was on another press. He would literally like every time the other guy started a job, he would like slide the shirt over on his side of the dryer and like ultra inspect it, <laughs> and like give him shit for it. And it's just like. Yeah. Dude, it's unnecessary. It's just toxic in the... Yeah, and they got to the point where, again, it was like everybody was... Certain days, you could tell he was in a bad mood. And, like, everybody walked on eggshells all day because they didn't want to piss him off to where it was just, like, going to be a worse day. And it got to the point where I was just like, I got to let you go. Like, mm. I can't have you here. How, how and then, did like, you, as soon, how did you, as, soon as he went away, it was way better. That's my fear when I look at a friend... As far as like a hire is to say, okay, if this person is like very long term, makes sense. But I worry that, you know, if it's a friend or something that's related to somebody or something like that, that like I just don't want to cause problems outside of work. Yeah. In in our yeah. personal lives. Did, did that happen afterwards or, you know? Yeah, or, I haven't spoken to him since. So. <laughs> really? Was it yeah. a good friend before or is just, you know? Yeah, it was a good friend. Wow. And, and like that's the thing too is like I said, culture wise, like, the core guys that are here, I hang out with like every day. Like we do stuff together nights and weekends. We hang out, you know, we, and the funny thing is, is like this business for me, isn't a money making machine to where I'm just like, this is a business. I'm going to take this money. I'm going to do all this stuff outside of work with it and live my life outside of work. Like I literally try to grow the business so that I can just have fun during the day. Hmm. Um, so like, like right now with the renovations next door, like half of the fucking room that we just put together is going to be for like gaming on weekends. Like the break room is like nice and has like a kitchen and everything, but like we're setting it up to have like two big TVs, two Xboxes, big couch. So that like 
on breaks and on nights and weekends, we can come here and just like play video games and hang out or watch movies or whatever. And it's like, again, the th- same thing with like the motorcycle stuff. Like everybody here is into motorcycles. So we'll, we'll work hard to where we can get ahead to where there's a nice day. We can just all go for a ride. Like it's about hanging out with everybody here and blaring music and having a good time all day while we're working. So it's like, we're all dedicated to this because we love it and it fuels our, like the rest of our life. Um, but a lot of it is just like a place to like, we make money to just do fun stuff and then come back to do it all over again. Wow. So that's kind of like the culture here. I think the interesting thing is like as shop owners, we spend more time with our employees than we do our spouses and family and friends even. Right. And so for some of these people, they're around you for 40 hours a week or more. Yeah. And that's a lot of time. Like you learn a lot about one another very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, I think that that toxic employee is like, I, I've, I've learned to cut bait a lot quicker. You know, we had some toxic employees when we had just started that were in the company for a pretty long time. And the second we let them go, you just felt like liberated a little bit. Yeah. No, um, for real. Seriously. Yeah. I, I remember like I, it would be awful. It like ruins the day. But right? it always takes yeah. so long to do. I mean, how long did it take you guys each to, to let them go? Well, that guy was here for seven years <laughs> and then I let him go. See, yeah, I mean, I mean, he wasn't like that the entire time. Right. Like it was like five years in, there was like hints of him just being an asshole. And then it was like, you know, there was times where you had to have a talk with him and then like two weeks would go by and he was fine. And then it was back to being an asshole again. And the funny part is, is like, I literally, I like, I fired him at one point. I was like, all right, you're gone. And he was gone for months. And then we got really busy again. Like it was like at the end of busy season, let him go. And then we got really busy in summer and I hadn't hired somebody to replace him yet. And, uh, I was like getting ready to hire again when we got busy and my friends who also work for me were like, give them a second chance. Like <laughs> it sounds like a relationship. <laughs> but the thing was, is it wasn't necessarily because of the fact that like we wanted him back to hang out. Yeah. It was because he was a good printer. And that was the hard part is like, he was a really good printer. Right. Like he was dedicated to working. He was just an asshole. So when it gets busy, you kind of stop thinking about him being an asshole. And you think about like, we could get this many more jobs out if he worked here. So then I, again, it was like a ex-girlfriend thing. And I was like, you're, you're drinking. Be, it was like, you're drinking. Yeah, was like, maybe it'll be better again this time. <laughs> you're, you're shooting her text late after drinking. All yeah. I was, I was, I was drunk texting and I was like, <laughs> Hey babe, do you want to come back? Um, was it, did it take long for you too, Farrag or? Uh, yeah. And it was more of a, like a little owner disagreement of we have work to get done. And it would be too hard to replace that person versus like, I can't stand working with them up until the point where I was like, we're, I I mean, kind of drew a line in the sand. and was like, we can't operate any longer like this. Yeah. So like Dylan, how do you, you know, being that you have an awesome culture of super loyal employees and friends when times get tough or like when pandemic hit and now you're a business owner and you're starting to look at things, maybe freak out, maybe not. Did your conversations with them change? Did you go closer to them? Were they a little bit worried? Like, how did that work I out? I feel like I'm in a different situation. Like, I, I got really fortunate with the way that I set this company up that I didn't have to worry about it too much. And I feel like we've, over the years, because like I said, they've all been here since the beginning. And in the beginning, you do a lot of stupid shit. Like, you do stuff with money that you shouldn't do. Um, so there were times like when we're slow in the winter in the beginning, I don't have one of those yet. You know what? We sold out of the first 50, 450 more just arrived <laughs> and, uh, it'll be on its way. Straight out okay, of Shang's okay. Um, yeah, you so, do yeah, stupid the, stuff like, with money. Go ahead. Yeah. So Sorry. like in the beginning, there was times like in the winter when you're slow where you just like can't afford payroll and like, that's something as a business owner, you're like, I can never do that. Like I, I need to have payroll. But it was just me and my buddies at the time. And it was like, they were like, oh, it's okay. Like, I'll get it next week or I'll get it the week after or whatever. So I feel like all of us just like know what's going on and we're buckled down and we're like committed to this. Even though I'm the owner, um, we all kind of work together on the whole thing. But uh, yeah, it's just, 
I don't know. It's, it just kind of works out. We all kind of just see what's going on. But with COVID, like I said, the, the reason why I was fortunate is like I paid for all my equipment. Like I don't go, I don't like lease anything. Um, so all my equipment's paid for and I own the building we're in and it's paid for. So realistically, we could kind of just like close the doors, come in and work and not really have to deal with COVID too much because of where our location is. It's being super rural. We're not like in the city or anything. Um, we applied to be essential in the beginning just because we do a lot of stuff for like construction workers and uh, like hospitals and stuff like that too. Um, so we just stayed open. And like I said, pretty much everybody who's worked, who works here with the whole COVID thing, we all come to work in the morning, we work and then we go home. It's not like we're going clubbing at night and spreading it and like in worry of bringing it back to the shop. It's like, we just work, go home, come back, do it all over again the next day. So, um, the, a lot of the like salespeople and art department and all that stuff, when it first happened, I sent them home. They were still getting paid. They were just working from home just to be like extra careful. And then I only had a couple production people here. Um, but that only lasted, you know, a couple weeks to a month or whatever. And then we were like, let's just, we're so busy. Like we just need to have everybody back. Um, oh. Dylan, you so said uh, something, good. um, you own your own building, you buy your equipment, um, outright who taught you how to do that. Cause like, that's a, I hear of shops on both sides of the aisle. Some will say I buy in cash. I have no debt. Some are like, no, it's better to keep your cash rent, you know, lease equipment. Um, who, how did that, is, is that just, you've done that over the years? Did someone teach you that? Um, I think a lot of it is just because I didn't grow up with money. Um, so it was kind of like you buy stuff when you have it. Like if you don't buy, if you go out and do everything on credit or credit cards or leasing everything, like you never know what's going to happen. Like you can, you know, like even if you were like buying shoes and clothes on a credit card, like what happens if you don't have the money to pay that shit? Like your credit goes to hell. You can't buy anything. Nobody trusts you. Um, and I've just always kind of been that way of like, just get it paid off because for me, as soon as I owe anybody anything, like even if it's a friend, I own 20 bucks, like I can't do it. It stresses me out. I'm like, I don't like that they have that over me and that, you know, I'm like a moocher and I'm like taking money from them. So to me, it's kind of like, I just like to get it gone. I have no stress over it. Um, so that's the same thing with like equipment and all that was kind of like, let's find out the best way to get the money to just buy it and have it. And then I never have to worry about it at all. So, um, it was, awesome. that the, no, was that the thought on, on the building too? Cause as Steven was mentioning, right? Like people don't, I think some shops are like, well, I'm kind of young. I don't know my space requirements and all these other things. Yeah. Um, now nah, let, let's just hold off. And others like, like you, it sounds like, or well, we're going to invest a lot in this building. It's got room to grow and so on. Mm -hmm. Or how did you come across it? Was it a deal? How, how did that happen? <laughs> Dude. The building is like a crazy situation. Like I never wanted to buy a building. And, and, and again, it's all, I'm, I'm not like this business mastermind that like thought of all these brilliant ways of like <laughs> paying for my equipment. Crazy and whiteboard buying a building. Uh, diagram. Right. Like you. right now, like right now it makes a lot of sense. And I'm like, shit, like I did it right. But like, it was all on accident. Like I am not that guy who's like thinking things out and like, oh, in 20 years, if I do it this way and this way. I'm going to have X amount of dollars. I literally just like dumb ass rolled into shit. And I was just like, Oh, this worked out. Um, so when I was in our two car garage, we just were to the point, like after the first year where we were like counting shirts in the grass and like, we had no room <laughs> at all. Like literally saw horses in the grass, piece of plywood, counting shirts outside. Um, and then I came to our town where I live and I was just looking to see if there was any bigger space that I could rent. And I didn't know what I could afford. I was just like looking, well, there was this old train station, which is what we're in right now. And, uh, the guy here again, everybody knows everybody in this town. Cause like my, the town I live in has like 1500 people. So like everybody knows everybody here. And then I walk in, I start talking to the guy. It was, a uh, hunting and fishing store and where our actual shop is was an archery range so it was like this mm -hmm. big warehouse concrete floors everything um and i walked in and he was kind of old trying to retire a little bit 
so he wasn't using the archery range anymore. And I was like, hey, would you want to rent out this space? Uh, I, you know, have a screen printing shop. I'm looking for more room. He's just like, yeah, I don't think I want to take on like a renter. I'm trying to get out of this whole thing. Uh, and I, he's like, let's have a conversation again in like a week or something. And I was like, uh, I was really good friends with the, the local real estate agent guy. And I went and talked to him and I was like, well, you know, what's going on? And he, he hit me up and he's like, you know, Hap's trying to sell that building. And I was like, dude, I don't have any money. Like, I probably have like $500 in my bank account. Like, I cannot afford anything. And he's like, well, like, don't spread this around. But basically, like, he can't sell that building through a bank because it was an old Agway. And the train literally, like, right outside my window here, the train tracks are like 10 feet away. Oh. So, like, the train in the old days would, like, pull up beside the building and drop, like, grain and, you know, all kinds of farm stuff into the, like these tanks in the ground well i guess when they did that over years and years it like polluted the the soil out back to where like if they did a you know some kind of environmental survey thing like it wouldn't pass to like sell through a bank so he went and talked to the guy who owns the building and was like hey like you're not going to get what you want for it if you sell it you know you need to lower your expectations so anyway i came in here one day to talk to him and he was like He's like, what do you think about buying the building? And I was, again, I was like, dude, I don't have the money, uh, whatever. And he was like, I'll sell it to you for, well, I, I don't care if I tell you what I bought it for. I bought this building for $60,000. Wow. How many square feet are you in? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to do the math, but I think it's like 10,000. But I, the thing is, is it's like, it's a super long building and it's this old building. It needed a lot of work. It was usable. Like it had heat, it had electric, it had everything we needed to get going. Um, so I was like, I can't pass, I can't pass up on this deal. So I went to my parents and my parents loaned me 10 grand to pay him like a down payment. To, and the funny thing is, is like our whole deal was all a handshake. There was no <laughs> bank, no nothing. It was just like. Hey, I'll pay you 500 bucks a month for 10 years. And he was like, okay, cool. So like, that's what I did. Um, and so every year, basically again, paying with cash, it was like the first, the first year we were here, we had like two manuals and, uh, uh, like a little buddy dryer. It was the, the M and R Economax. Um, so it was this huge, like warehouse space with like two manuals and that little dryer in the middle. And then every year we added stuff, added stuff. But again, it was like, let's do X amount of jobs, take that profit and let's like redo the plumbing. And then it was like, let's, uh, you know, redo the electric. So over 10 years, basically as of right now, this entire building is fully remodeled, like all new electric, all new plumbing, all new insulation, like spray foam insulation, in the walls, all new sheetrock, everything. So if you look on the outside, it looks like an old train station. And then if you come inside, it's all brand new. So, like I said, being now 10 years, the building's basically brand new and I could probably sell it for way more than I paid for Wow. It. Do you think, Dylan, now, I mean, you've basically made it your home. Do yeah. you ever think you'll get to a point where you outgrow it or are you like, no, this is where I'm, this is where I'm staying. Like when I outgrow this, I'm done. Or like, again, it's kind of one of those things like I stumbled into, but, um, I feel like. And I've said this a couple of times on different podcasts, but I feel like the way our shop is and the niche market we're in and what we're doing, I feel like I want to stay where we're at with our presses and our equipment and our employees. Um, I just want to basically never be slow. I want to have all the business that we want to have and I want to be able to turn stuff down. That's like my goal is to turn shit down. Um, so right now after we got the new gauntlet three the shop's a little tight um but we're actually thinking about in the spring adding another 40 feet onto the building to uh give us more shipping receiving space because right now that's our biggest problem is shipping and receiving like we have a space that's probably like like 40 by 40 or something that we're having shipping receiving in and it's fucking like there's boxes everywhere and like out by the presses there's like pallets of boxes so I just need more space to put stuff. Um, but as far as production and flow and the office and all that stuff, like everything's good. So I think, I think we're good here. Worst case scenario, uh, if we ever need to get bigger, I'll just buy the building across the street and then 
I'll just have more space over there if I have to. Or I'll just buy land and I'll build another building uh, and have another department. I don't want to do that because I want to have everything in the same building. But I feel like if I had to, I would. Yeah, that's interesting. Like my, so I have a business partner that's twice my age and he's, you know, um, kind of taught me the same things and he, he made us buy this building that we're in. But once you own your building, you're not scared of like land and building or anything anymore because you realize the benefits of having your own, I think are the coolest part. Um, and when times get tough, like I wish my rent was 500 bucks a month, but, um, (laughs) right now it's zero. Yeah. Uh, but like I could freeze my, because what happens is when you own your own building, you pay yourself rent, right? The business Mm -hmm. will pay rent to the company that owns the building, which is essentially you. So it's a profit center, but when times get tough, you can turn that off or turn it on. And so I think, you know, as shops are thinking about, do I buy, sell, you know, do I buy rent lease? You know, if you have the ability to own, you know, your land, it's, it's not a crazy thing if the market's good. I mean, if the resale's good and you're not and yeah. you feel like you can afford it i, I wouldn't recommend that I feel to like everyone the, i feel like the <laughs> biggest thing the biggest thing with that and like me in doing other podcasts and like interviewing other shop owners about it is it depends on what your your market is for your shop so like if you're a shop like and i had this talk with a shirt agent shirt agency about his place and he's like in la and he his market is I listen LA. to that one where he said he pays you know what i mean like he's month. yeah yeah, like that's crazy to me. Like I couldn't imagine being like, "Oh, here's like ten grand, like, like gone." Like you, you do it did nothing for you other than you were occupied that space for a month. Like to me, that's crazy. But the problem is, is like his market is that area. It's almost you know it's, I mean? it's cost like, of doing business in that. Like, it's yeah. the cost of doing business for that. But for me, like I did barely do any local business at all like i could be on the top of a mountain somewhere and still have the same business i have now because it's all on the internet it's all over the u.s it's in canada it's in uk australia like we're shipping all over the world as long as they're willing to pay the freight so for me it works like i can be in the middle of nowhere um so i can't go to everybody and be like buy your own building you're an idiot if you don't own your own building because it's like I couldn't imagine what it costs to buy a building in LA. Like that's got to be crazy. I mean, we just but, uh, we were talking to Max um, at Family Industries, and they ha- they built up, yeah, literally up because they just couldn't couldn't take over a huge footprint. And even then, he's like, yeah. I, "There's only so much up I can go." Uh, I think the other thing that was really interesting that you said, Dylan, is like you have to look for the deals in commercial real estate. Same thing happened is like people don't realize they want to sell their building until you provoke the conversation of like, hey, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think you go on LoopNet and just find commercial real estate. You kind of navigate your town, figure out where there's back alleys of buildings and then navigate that. (laughs) This is terrible to say, but there's always people going out of business. Right. There's always people in hard times that are like, fuck it, I'm done with it, that want to sell their building and start over. Um, but the other part of it too is, is that you need to lower your expectations. Like a lot of people, even screen printers with equipment, they, they, they start screen printing in their first or second year and they're like, Oh, I'd love to have a gauntlet three, or I'd love to have the biggest, best dryer and the biggest, best this. It's like, dude, slow down and like, get what you can afford and go slow. And eventually you'll get there. Like you will get there just like earn it and take the time to get it. And it's the same with a building. Like, like when I bought this place, like I, in my mind, I could have been like, I want to be this business and I want this building to have everything that I put into it now, but right away, I would have been having to buy a building in my area. It would have been like, Oh, I'm going to spend $300,000 on a commercial space. And it's like, I spent $60,000 on a shithole and I put money into it as I had it. And now it's exactly the way I want it. So I feel like you just need to get what works and then eventually upgrade it to where you want it to be. Like there's no need to go out and spend way more money than you have on something that you could eventually get if you took the time. Wow. That's super cool. You do, uh, you do a lot of different podcasts and and content that you put out. Um, what's the thoughts behind it? Obviously shirt show, which has been awesome to listen to as well. Um, cause there's, we just like Andy, not <laughs> yeah. you. I'm just kidding. Right. I get it. Slash yeah. the slash, just the overall banter. Soft, soft handy. Um, <laughs> I, I think like 
it, like, is it a marketing thing or is it just something you guys are no. passionate about or, 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 yeah. Um, for me again, like my hobby and it's funny cause like, again, back to my crew, they all have their own hobbies. Like a lot of them are into music still or into mm-hmm. art or video or whatever. And my hobby is this, like my passion is screen printing and the shop and, when I'm home and I'm bored, I come back here, not because I have work to do, but because this is my place to hang out and like do shit. Um, yeah. So, I saw that cause a lot of the episodes are filmed on Sunday. It seems like, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's Andy's doing again. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm a night owl and I like, like when I do the upstate podcast, I do it at like 11 o'clock at night. Um, but Andy's always like, yeah, I, I have to go to bed at eight 30. Um, <laughs> and I'm just like, like that doesn't work for me. But, uh, yeah, with the podcast, it was just like, it does seem you just have a natural passion for, by the way, we, we're going to link down below so you guys can follow both of them. Cause I, I really like it. I'm going to show you guys some love yeah. on it. And... So the podcast thing came about because again, when I started, I started when social media kind of started. Like for me, my space was like the start of social media for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've always well, you been on, like you on, on social Friendster media or Tumblr. No, or... no, I missed out just grinder. <laughs> um, but yeah, I started out on there and I was always on it and interactive because it, for me, it was like before that, when I was a younger kid, it was aim, you know, mm-hmm. like you get home from school and you're on AIM ASL. and you're talking to your, you, you just saw your, yeah, yeah. Check. Yeah. Um, but you're so away, but you're... <laughs> back then it was like lacrosse or 45 or something. Bruce, I played what was lacrosse yours? as a kid. Hold on. Um, I think it was Schechter. So I was also a big, uh, metal guy actually in high school it's just not something many people know about but um i think it was Schechter like 781 or so, so a couple numbers so i had this uh it's like a Schechter c1 it was Schechter 6969 <laughs> it probably was um <laughs> and you know it's just like super high gain guitar right and um and i i like that was just my my baby and so that turned into my screen bruce name. redid his myspace every week uh yeah. just new html every single week <laughs> yeah glitter the snow marquee big marquee down. guy bruce yeah big rotating marquee going in i feel like that's a that's a deep hole we could all get into right now it's who was in our top eight. Oh my gosh oh man um but yeah anyway like with that whole thing and even now with like instagram for me instagram is just like a place where i can still talk to my friends like and most of my friends are all other printers. Yeah. You just slide into so, everybody's DMs. Yeah, I'm just sliding into DMs, giving them all the good picks. <laughs> um but yeah, it's just kind of like again, there was the the podcast thing started because it was like every day I'd be talking like I could talk to you or Andy or you know, thousands of other printers that I talk to all day on DMs. But a lot of times we would get into a good conversation about like inks or the way we do things or whatever, or just shooting the shit and uh, it started because it was like, why don't I do a podcast where I talk to these people where all these other people can listen to that conversation and maybe they'll gain some little nugget of information that they didn't have. So, you know, you talk to all these people and you gain this knowledge and you're like, you know, I I know this other guy would really benefit from that conversation we just had. Um, So then I started the Upstate podcast, just me talking to whoever. And then me and Andy have been pretty close for, quite a long time and we would just call each other like once a week or whatever and like talk about our week and what we were doing and and whatever and uh he bought a mic and everything and we were like hey let's do let's do another show where we can talk together because i feel like me and andy are, are good friends but we're also like polar opposites on a lot of things where like i tend to be more like digging in an asshole and he's like soft handy um so it works out well when we're talking to somebody about something and he, we disagree on it and then we yell at each other. Um, but it's all in good fun. Like it's just us talking to each other and me giving him shit and him giving me shit. But, um, I like doing it. Like I said, it, to me, all this is just fun. Like I like talking about screen printing. I like learning new things. I like doing complicated prints to, just have the fun of it. Like I, 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 I would much rather do really cool, fun prints all day long than be like, I did 10, 10,000 piece orders this week. 
you know for what I mean? Sure. So for me, it's just the fun of like making other people's art awesome. I appreciate you you putting those on too. I, I really like listening and um, I'm not uh, not doing any complicated prints, but I love just like yeah. hearing other people's perspectives and just constantly learning. A lot of it's a lot of it's honestly just shop talk. Like it's like if you went to somebody's yeah. shop and you were just standing or in the just day to day problems. Dryer, it's right. very interesting. Just shooting the shit. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, what That's about good. marketing for your shop? Because you talked about wanting to get to a position where you're turning down jobs all the time. Mm-hmm. Is that a sales thing? Is that a marketing thing? You also talk about being in a more rural area. So, like, are you mm-hmm. expanding? Do you have to expand outside of, you know, your town, or are you are you already doing that? Really, I feel like we're very, very close to that goal right now because we're pretty busy a lot of the time and we're doing a lot of the work that we want to do. Um, I just, I'm more with this renovation, I'm going to add one or two more customer service people. We don't really have any sales people. Uh, it's just customer service because, again, I feel like day to day I walk into a couple hundred emails Um so basically at one point I hired somebody to help me with those emails. And then Chris was in the office. He had the same thing. He would walk into hundred emails in the morning. Um, so pretty much what we're doing is we're adding somebody every time we get to a point where our inbox gets too high. Um, so we're just kind of like getting people to, my goal with cus- is just customer service basically. Like I want to make sure every customer who emails is answered quickly and we, we don't just brush them off or like give us your money and we want your order it's like a lot of times we get customers who are like hey i want 100 shirts here's my design uh whatever a lot of times we're not just like okay cool well he probably wants a guild 8000 and uh you know let's just do all plastic all here take your money a lot of times we're like well if you're gonna do a clothing line maybe you should think about not cutting out a guild and tag and doing like a bella 3001 cvc because the if we do 3001 it it might shrink because it's cotton so let's do a blend and on that blend we could also like discharge the underbase because it's a really thick print and then put plastisol on top so it's softer and then oh while we're at that do you want to rebrand this and add a tag like a neck tag it's more consultative Uh, right like i'd rather go through that with the customer and get like more knowledge than they thought they needed so that they're like holy shit these guys like got me where i wanted to be and i didn't have to figure it out on my own right Cause I feel like a lot of people don't say that they're just like, this is what I think I want. Like I went on YouTube three times and like watched a couple of videos. I'm going to start a clothing line. Right. And then, and, and as long as you don't it. mess it up, right. they're yours for life. Like they exactly. won't leave because that loyalty is there. And it's like just that customer service of just, just being so good to them. Right. Um, you, you just, and, and the, tr- the truth of it is, is like, if you want to get into a certain market, like get, two or three or four people that are in that space that have really cool art or help them get really cool art. And then all you have to do is take those designs or that portfolio you made of those things and just go after other people and be like, look what I did for so-and-so. And And then they're like, Oh shit, that's really cool. I'll do that too. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been the whole snowball the, the entire time. It's just like, we're going after the people we want to work with, not necessarily waiting for people to just come here. With the emails and stuff, Stephen, uh, you've had some people just handle your inbox a lot more too. Do you remember when that transition was? Because I specifically was like, I'm doing a bad job because there's so much constantly going on, responding, getting back to people. And I know somebody else can be able to handle this and help me more. Or... When, when did that happen for you guys? Because I know you've talked about assistance. We've had this conversation multiple times. Yeah. Obviously, we you've used got to, people that can access your inbox. Yeah. we. I mean, we started with just G Suite for business, and we had a shared inbox. Everything was like info at campus.inc, and you could send it from Steven, Matt, Mila, And we literally, because there were like three of us that were just doing all the sales, it was first in, first out, just get them answered. And, and just read the conversation before and just let them know that the three of us are tag teaming it. Um, and then from there, um, I, I use front app. I don't know. It just works really well, but you can delegate your inbox to certain people. And so the team knows they like go through my inbox and we'll just pick stuff off. What's other, what's cool about it is you can assign it to people too, or you can chat about it. Um, 
but essentially I'll do a lot of the introductory work or like, and once we're ready to start processing it, I'll just be like, Hey, Allison from our team is going to take this and process it. I'm still here if you need anything. Um, but then it's just a, and, and they just, they know that. And I think they respect that you're able, they, I don't think they're offended by it by any means. Um, but we get crazy about response time. Like we want it within minutes. So people are just like, Whoa, they responded already. You know, um, I, feel like I get, I get that a lot too, where like, like you were saying, Bruce, of like handling it is like, I might get a lot of the emails, but it, if I just tell people, and the biggest thing with all of this is just being completely honest with every customer and just being like, Hey, I know you wanted to talk to me, but in all honesty, if you want this actually done or you want this like done right, I'm going to forward you to Sarah. Who's actually going to take care of you today. Yeah. Like if you want to talk to me, it might be two weeks before I yeah, actually get to your like project. Exactly. But people do obviously, you know, you're, you're their connect, right? You're the inside right. guy. I'll still talk to them if they want to talk about like, how they want to do things or if they need help with something, I'm like, yeah, call Here's my cell phone. Right. Call me. Um, but like, if you want somebody to go through and like, give you the whole, like use this shirt or these are the prices and all this other stuff. It's like, dude, I do not have time in the day to do that. If you want it done within like the next hour, Sarah will do it for you right now. You just forward it like, over to her or just email it right. to her. Or... Yeah. I just forward it over at this yep. point, everything like the print it upstate merch.com email is like where the website sends everybody, everything that all comes to me. So my first thing in the morning is going through and being like, this email is best suited for Sarah. This email is best suited for Chris. And I just like forward them all Mr. off. Triage. Yeah. And then I look at stuff too, where I'm like, oh, this is like a huge customer that like, I should probably take the time out of my day to like, baby, like I'm going to talk to you. Uh, not that I don't trust these other people, but like for me, that's like the playing the video game and getting to the next level. It's like that rush of like, holy shit, we're going to work with this person. Um, so like, I like to take on those cause I'm selfish. Um, but the day to day stuff, I'll be like, all right, you're best suited for this person and so on. Wow. Dylan, do you guys use uh, video calling at all now or FaceTiming with customers or like zooming with them to show them at all? Or is it all just basically email? It's basically email. I will do that if they want to. I've definitely done that before. Um, but I feel like the biggest thing customers want to see is they want to, they want to see and feel blanks or samples. So, and again, we're not dealing with local. So not a lot of people are walking in here and looking at our display. They're like in California. So what I'll do is I'll basically be like, well, what items are you looking for? Like, what do you ideally want? And they're like, all right, well, I want like a really nice long sleeve. I want this, uh, a really nice hoodie. And I'm like, okay. Here's the Bella long sleeve. Here's the independent hoodie. Here's whatever. And then I'll just call my SNS rep and be like, Hey, send four or five of these samples to this person. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is, is that they're sending it from California. So that customer will get it the next day. And they're like, Holy shit. Like you got me samples of all these items the next day. And then I'll just email mockups and I'll talk to them about what's what. And if they want to see a printed sample, I'll overnight or second day, a printed shirt from here. That's smart. The speed is just the speed like is the speed biggest is thing. Everything. They're like, holy shit, we just I just like did a preliminary email with you yesterday, right. and today I have everything already. Yeah. Like the speed is to look at. And, and Dylan, you're not making them jump through hoops and be like, well, there's a sample, and you're gonna have to pay for this. You're just like, I don't make them pay for it because I mean, and and that's the, and I think you know shops could look at that and say like. Oh, how much money am I going to be spending in samples? Call it a thousand dollars a year, two thousand dollars a year. When that customer gets that bag the next day and goes, "Holy cow, this is yeah. mine!" And they feel it. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing too is that like we don't spend any money on like, like advertising or marketing or anything, or just like the regular boosted posts. But like, it's not like there's people who go out. It is and be your like, marketing. Oh, yeah, it's I, your market. Is, right, yeah. but that's what I mean. Is there's people that'll go out and spend a couple thousand dollars on a billboard. And like, you might get like two sales from that, or like, you don't even know if you got any sales from it. It's like, how many samples could you send with $2,000 to like real good customers you could be going after? Um, you know, if and, you ever uh, give Bruce access to your SNS account, he might um, <laughs> order stuff and accidentally change the default address. And then your entire right. production team sends everything to his apartment or condo. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, I'm done for this month for giving Bruce access to my SNS account. I'm looking <laughs> we, for volunteers. We have our own resale. It's just Farrick has uh, uh, nice setups because obviously a volume, but yeah. yeah. 
Well, that's the thing with us with like SNS or Broder or whatever is like, they're not even charging us for these samples most of the time because of the volume we do. Like, oh, I don't go to awesome. them. I'm just saying like, I don't go to them every day for samples. Right. It's like, I might do a couple a month, but it's like, they know I'm not trying to rip them off. I'm usually like, I call my rep and I'm like, hey, there's this customer that's, you know, like I'll say who it is or it's a big podcast or a big comedian or a big company. And I'm like, hey, these guys want samples and if they like it, they're going to order a lot of this. And they're like, okay, cool. Because to them, it's like, yeah, it's the same thing like you're doing. Down the line, they're doing one yeah. blank hoodie. Right. It's the same thing for them as it is for us. Like we're looking to give a little investment, like under $10 to get way more than that so dylan wh what is your day-to-day -day look like now and and also what do you want your day-to-day -to, -day to be because i've hmm. been sort of thinking about this more of of this is what i'm doing now i feel like we talk about this i, I feel like just like you call andy a lot i call farragut just be like dude here's what i did but you know i i really need yeah. we need to be focused I mean, we were talking yesterday about you know your software and stuff it was like i need to be focusing on this stuff but it's hard to. to Bruce calls me at like seven thirty in the morning. <laughs> I'm, I don't I'm know more why of an early like rising too. So early, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, realistically, we start at nine, so I'll get here like eight thirty. Uh, usually, it's just it, it's not to get here early to get, like get extra shit done. It's for me to sit down and drink my iced tea and watch YouTube videos to like get the day started what youtube videos is it like vlogs? well stuff? i first of all i almost always start off with some kind of print video if there's anything new oh, okay like anybody put out that's print like a vendor or a if it's not or that yeah if it's not that it's usually like i really like uh colin furs he just like builds crazy shit um there's like a ton of other stuff that i watch it's usually like what honestly it's usually whatever youtube like populates that it thinks i'll like i'll go through like the top 10 and be like that looks interesting um but for me i i love movies like movies is like my other relaxing hobby like if i have free time it's i'm watching movies so i'll watch a lot of trailers or i'll go to joe blow and watch all the trailers that they have um but yeah so anyway in the morning i do that and then the second thing i do is i'll go through my email and i'll forward everything off to whoever it needs to go to and then realistically my whole day after that is just responding to emails and putting out fires at work um it's usually just like somebody's grabbing me on press because something's not looking right or we need to figure something out or there's a tractor trailer pulling up that needs me to go through the stuff that they're dropping off or whatever so my biggest problem is i feel like i have so much stuff to do that's not necessarily customer related it's more just like running the business and like doing all the things that a business owner needs to do mm -hmm. that I, my goal is to get once this renovation's done is get those other two customer service people to where they're handling almost all of my emails, like everything to where what I really want to focus on is my going after the really big fish that I want to get for customers. Um, again, like I said, like, we're comfortable, but there's, there's companies that I really want to work with that are like on my, I do that like dream 100 thing. What's that? So basically like I make a list that it doesn't have to be a hundred people, but realistically what I'll do is I'll make a list on my phone all the time of like people I look up to or companies I really want to work with, or I think have like cool ideas or cool culture or whatever. And then again, it's stuff that I'm already into. So what I'll do is I'll put together a promotional box or whatever. Well, first I'll start a conversation. I'll like start talking to them about stuff or liking their posts and commenting on stuff. And this isn't a marketing thing. It's just like I'm already talking to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the time arises, when something pops up where they post a new design or they post something about trying to do some kind of marketing thing or whatever, I'll put together a promo box of like, Here's some teas we printed. Here's some stuff I think you'll like. Here's this. And here's a note, like a handwritten thing or whatever. And I'll just mail it to them. And then again, it's that sample thing. Like they're looking at it. They're like, oh, this is awesome, whatever. And then it just furthers that conversation where they're like, like you sent me all this stuff. Like, that's awesome. Like, obviously this costs you something. Now I'm going to have a real conversation with you. 
Um, and we've done that with some like really big companies. And it's crazy too, because like a lot of people, like smaller printers are always like, how'd you get to work with so-and-so? How'd you get to work with so-and-so? It's like, dude, I just had a conversation with them. Like I was a real person talking to them about real stuff. And then they were like, yeah, I want to work with you. Nobody wants to get that email. Like we all get those emails all day long that are like, like 10 paragraphs long they're like i would love to work with you uh we sell digitizing and it's just like you just delete it instantly it's like yeah we tell our but if somebody too. if but if somebody who owns a company hit me up on instagram and was like started a real conversation with me about something that i just did that they're like oh i really like this thing you did um let's talk about it and have a conversation and then afterwards they were like well i own this company and i'm like cool like right. let's work together somehow right yeah I think what's interesting there too, Dylan, is uh, the person behind the other Instagram is also probably a business owner or someone in marketing right. or someone that wants to do something creative too. So it's like there's commonality just by having that one-to-one -one conversation. But I think the other thing that I, I admire is you don't really worry about the sale when you're building your right. relationships. Like the, it's like the, the sale comes last. Like you focus on the shirt completely last. And because you're engulfed in the community, because you have similar, similar interests, you take time to get to know them. The sale is the easiest part of it, you know? Yeah. That's really super the, rad. Like, like you said, it is the last part of it. Cause it's like, all right, I've done everything in my power with the knowledge that I have to help you out. Let's go ahead and make your stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and that it's cool when it's on press, but really it's like, let me get down your information. Let's figure out the shirt sizes, all that stuff. Like to me, that's the boring part of like, let me do this transaction. But when like it comes off, the screens are made and it's on press and you're like, hell yeah, this print's gonna look awesome. Like we did this 12 color simulated process print. Uh, it took us a couple hours to like figure out how the blends were gonna be and everything else. But then when it's on press, inks are in the screen, first test print comes around and it's like, hell yeah, this came out awesome. But the biggest rush from that isn't necessarily looking at the print and being like, oh, this is awesome. It's that I know the customer's gonna be fucking stoked. You know what I mean? Like, this looks awesome. We talked about it. We put it on the shirt that I helped him figure out. We figured out exactly the way the design should be. It came out flawlessly. That dude, when he gets that box and opens it up, is going to be like, Dylan fucking came through. You know what I mean? Like, they helped me out with this. Um, so to me, that's like the biggest rush of it is just knowing that we made something awesome and they're going to be excited to get it and open it. Yeah. I think I think thing. half of of sales a lot of time is just they like you, and then the other half is you're adding value to them. Yeah. But absolutely, it's just you guys are friends. You, you know, they just like hanging out with you. They just like you as a person. Yeah, and that's like we're not trying to create a culture here. I feel like it's just the way we are, and that's why I said there's there's part of the culture that we have at Upstate that's just like I can't show the public because we're all assholes. Like we're all, we say horrible things to each other. Uh, we're like the most non PC shop. Um, but it, we're all having fun all day long. Like that's the thing is like, <laughs> we did, uh, we just told everybody the night before the other day that we were going to dress up for Halloween. And like Nate showed up in his like $1,500 Batman costume. <laughs> and it was just like, like I made him print in that. And it was just like, it was just a fun day of like just goofing off and, and you've probably seen like from some of our YouTube videos, like we're not making YouTube videos for marketing. We're making them because it's just fun. Like we had Chris dress up as Macho Man and jump off the dryer through a desk. Like it had nothing that didn't sell any. Bill's Mafia. Bill's fans. Right. Like we, we just made, we just made a video about it. Took a day off of work to make a video because it was fun. Like there's one of me and Randy and Chris doing remaking Titanic. Like it doesn't I have anything to do with anything. These. I got it, yeah. <laughs> the best part about the Titanic one that's really funny to me is like I'm laying in the shirt bin at the end of the dryer and like blue shirts are coming off and I'm like sinking in, you know, like where he where he drops off the wood plank and is like sinking. To me that's the best part. Uh Bridget, can you just cut into this video and <laughs> put in this Merchel Man destroys desk with massive elbow drop from uh from upstate merch? That yeah, that, there's a bunch of those. And the funny thing about the Titanic one is like Brian has a recorder in his desk, like the, the old recorder like you would do at school. And he like learned the Titanic theme song on it. Um, so it's just it's just stuff like that all day. It's like 
everybody here is working and we're all dedicated to the craft and like the print and stuff but we're also just having trying to make the best of the day every day and like have a good time that's awesome so that's awesome that's yeah i mean thing. uh we're gonna have to uh you, you and andy are gonna have to come to chicago dude um, i'm trying like i would have been there already but andy's like oh, i'll have to find one works for me and like all this other stuff it's like I just, I'm just going to come out and visit m and anyway, um, but yeah, yeah, we should with, definitely get together. With uh, with ThreadX, we were all in Arizona. We texted Andy and said, come to Arizona, and he hopped on a plane and made it. So yeah. if, you just, just me. if you just come to Chicago, we'll plan your, your, your visit, and then we'll tell Andy, and then he'll have to come up because then he'd feel like right. an idiot if he didn't, didn't, uh, right. didn't make it. I'll just it. be there already, and you'll see, send a photo of us all sitting in a hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> did, I forgot about that. That was like he literally booked it the night before, and then I think he ended up going back or he stayed for a couple weeks. Or that, you dude, know. when Andy went there, he stayed there for like a month. Yeah, I mean, we were texting on a Sunday, and I'm like, "Hey, you should come to ThreadX. There's passes, you know, Bruce had." And I was kind of just like joking, and then he yeah. just like <laughs> he goes, "See you tonight." Just booked a flight, and Andy yeah. was there. No, um, that's awesome yeah he's a good dude and it's just funny because like i remember him calling me and talking to me and he was like yeah i think we're gonna take a couple extra days and like just hang out in arizona like i need a break from work or whatever and then i call him three days later and he's like yeah i think we're gonna stay here for another like five days and then after that five days he's like yeah we just booked another hotel for another like eight days <laughs> i was like what the hell are you doing like how are you not working he's like yeah i'm just recharging and i'm like what do you mean like who could say fancy month vacations? What, like, I can't uh, do that. Dylan, what, what do you feel like is next for Upstate? Uh, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm stoked to get this renovation done, have my own office. Uh, heat. Heat would We're be excited for awesome. You. Right now, I'm so cold right now. <laughs> I think the window next to me has frost on it. Um, yeah, just... Again, like I said, once we get the office space done and I can get other people in here to help me out customer service wise, like I plan on just going hard into um, just doing all the dream jobs I want to do. Like I want to go after the people and do cool shit and dream 100 more designers. I like my, that. My dream 100. Yeah. That's awesome. I've got about a dream eight. I need to expand <laughs> it. But that's the thing though. Like I said, it's, you got to think it's like the thing, the mentality of like, like celebrities are untouchable and stuff. It's like, they're just real people too. Like they do cool shit, but they're just real people. So if you can find a commonality and just talk to them about something, like there's no reason why you can't work together. 100%. Bruce, I just sent you my uh, dream feature request list. Um, it's <laughs> dream, a feature 1000. Announcing in Printavo, <laughs> add your dream and list. That's like, that's like the Steam thing about you, Steven, that like I've been learning through all these videos I'm watching and just, hearing you talk on stuff i feel like you have an app for your apps for your apps always <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah always i feel like i feel like me and andy need to have you on just to talk about it's uh, it's now a problem processes. it's now a problem and i'm getting help <laughs> yeah but that's the thing is like I, and i've talked to bruce about this too like we've had a conversation about printavo and like implementing it here and it's just like i told you like i still write shit down on paper Oh yeah, like, you and Andy aren't on Printavo. Where no. that's happening? Yeah, yeah. We're just gonna. I've we'll got, I've got, a, I've got something up my sleeve that. And it's I know, nothing. Uh, it's nothing against Printavo in any way. But like I said, like when me and Bruce had the conversation, it was just like. Yeah, you told me your process, and it was like I put this on this so, post-it note, and then I move it yeah, here. I'm like, okay, exactly. There's, so like when a customer when a customer pays here, I get like the email notification that they paid. I write it down on a piece of paper, and then like throughout the day we'll get like say like 20 30 payments or whatever i'll have a piece of paper with 30 payments on it and i hand it to chris <laughs> and i'm like add these to the schedule that's how that works no that's fine. yeah i mean i'm pumped <laughs> we're, we're, we're pumped to help out and we're always you know pushing forward too but um yeah. really appreciate you being able to join us you got to get farrag on the short show or upstate merch podcast or the dylan show or the late night dylan <laughs> the dylan show yeah <laughs> no but uh thanks so much dylan and i appreciate um you just sitting in that 30 degree room for yeah. uh, about an hour time man and 11 it's minutes. fun i'm good well when you come to chicago let us know because we've got a, a really cool little studio we set up so we can yeah and you guys are in the same building now as far as offices we are uh, we are sharing space we're bunk bedding uh <laughs> top that's 
if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> no, um, that's a nice space. Steven and and the best part is that Bruce pees the bed. <laughs> well, it drips well, down, so then it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got a cool space up there. Um, we've had shops come work for the day from there, and uh, just like a cool, cool space in River North. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to have everyone there. Yeah, for sure. Down. Let's do it. Boom. Thanks, guys. If you guys aren't following Upstate Merch, check them out on Instagram. Check them out on YouTube. Um, do you have any? Do you tweet or no? Do you TikTok? No. Absolutely. Check not. Dylan out on TikTok, TikTok too. <laughs> Grinder. <laughs> we'll see you guys again next week for the Printavo Print Hustlers podcast. Thanks for listening.